Ambassador Bamia, welcome to 7.30. Thank you. Now phone and internet connections have been restored after a near total blackout. What are you hearing from people in Gaza? So first, as soon as it was restored, you know, families were connecting with each other to know who had died, who was killed under the bombs and who was alive. We have 8,000 Palestinians killed, including 3,500 children and 2,000 women. That's 70% of those killed children and women. And the UN has said this is hell on earth. And therefore, since it's hell on earth, you have to stop the bombings, allow humanitarian aid in before everything collapses even more than it is now. The hospitals, the shelters, there's no food and fuel and water that are probably uh, access to the people who need them most and who are under threat to their lives. Let me ask you about the aid. Do you understand Israel's position that supplying fuel into Gaza could be potentially supplying fuel to Hamas to use on their generators in the tunnel system? No, I don't understand it because this is one of the most controlled assistance that exists and people are in such desperate needs that they will need the fuel to make the hospitals work. If the hospitals stop working, one third has already stopped working, you will see thousands of people dying if that fuel is not used or not put to proper use. So, you know, you cannot excuse everything by saying Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. Israel has its own obligations under international law that it needs to respect. And we need to understand these are thousands of lives that hang in the balance. And they, uh, as General Assembly has voted overwhelmingly to ask for humanitarian access, to call for a uh, humanitarian uh, truce that is immediate and, and durable, and to say that it's for rescinding the evacuation order and to call for the protection of all civilians. On that UN resolution, do you understand why 45 countries, including Australia, abstained from voting on the ceasefire, and they did so because the resolution didn't specifically recognise Hamas as the perpetrator of the October 7 attack? So there's a reference in the resolution to the 7th of October attack. There's a condemnation of all uh, violence that are targeted or aimed at uh, civilians, including acts of terrorism and indiscriminate attacks. Uh, there is calls to respect IHL under all circumstances and to protect all civilians. And that's why 120 nations have voted for the resolution, including a country like France, who cannot be suspected of not being an ally to Israel. But there's a limit to an alliance and to an unconditional support, which is war crimes and crimes against humanity. At the same time, there's no specific condemnation of Hamas for that attack on October the 7th. Those who know the UN know that when you decide to go for a humanitarian resolution, not only on Palestine, we're not the exception here, you decide to stick to humanitarian issues because if we had inserted a condemnation of what Israel is doing, some other countries would have had a, a problem to condemn Israel. So because you're not able to agree on the political narrative, you decide that saving thousands of lives has the priority. That's what's done in Syria, in Iraq, in many other instances. But, you know, some people believe Israel is such an exception that even a humanitarian resolution is hard to support. We have to be more serious and more responsible. This is bad for Palestinians and for Israelis alike. This hell in Gaza will not have good consequences. This is not how you produce a future of freedom for the Palestinians and peace and security for all. As a representative of Palestinians at the UN, do you condemn Hamas's attacks on October the 7th? You know, uh, I've been asked that by the Israeli representatives in the UN repeatedly, and I've told them I don't ask them to condemn and I don't ask them to mourn the Palestinian uh, killed. I ask them to stop killing them. We've been working extremely hard to avoid this exact scenario. But we have hundreds of Palestinians killed every year. We have thousands who have been killed over the last few years. We've had 8,000 killed now. And I'm still here telling you we are against killing Israeli civilians. We are against, And we cannot accept anybody justifying the killing of Palestinian civilians. You cannot say they kill our civilians, we kill their civilians, and then we spend another 100 years fighting. We need peace. We need an end of occupation. We need to be able to live side by side. Everybody deserves, all families deserve to be reunited in life and not to have to suffer and not to have to bury their loved ones and not to have to live in, in concern and frustration and, and, and resentment to, towards each other. And again, if we're able to say that while our people are under the rubbles, somebody should tell Israel they should have the same attitude. I just want to come back to what you said about the UN, and I'm not denying that international diplomacy is complex. We know that it is. But if the UN cannot find language to condemn an attack so obviously brutal against young children and the elderly, 
What is the point of the UN? So I said the, the, the UN condemned uh, every killing of a civilian. We, we cannot accept, by the way, we're not on the 7th of October, we're on the 30th. And again, 8,000 Palestinians have been killed. Those who are so biased and so blinded that they believe they could condemn one killing of civilians and not the other, there is something there. They should test their conscience. We are clear on our conscience that we are advocating for the rule of law for everyone. No exceptionalism for Israel, no exception for Palestine. Let me ask you this. The US president has told uh, Benjamin Netanyahu that his country needs to protect itself in a way that is consistent with international law. Now, you're an expert in international law. How could Israel defend itself against Hamas with its stated intention of destroying Israel in a way that is consistent with international law? How could it do that? I, I, I will tell you what we've told our people again when we were being killed, is that there is no military answer. I know people don't like to hear that. There is no military answer. If you have peace, we can convince our peoples, our nations to move away from any ideology that doesn't accept peace. If we demonstrate that peace works, that is the best tool. But at least what it cannot do is besiege two million and a half and bomb them and speak of vengeance and call them subhumans. I mean, all the narrative, and I think part of it is also that the person in charge, his political survival depends on this world staying and continuing. And I think the first thing is to get rid of Netanyahu, who's bad for the Palestinians, certainly, but who's also bad for, for Israel. And then let us make us make the courageous choice and see if our people follow us, if they accept that peace that we're able to sign. But till now, we have nothing, no alternative to offer to them than this terrible reality for our peoples. Can you have peace while Hamas is still in power in Gaza? I think, uh, again, if, you, if there is peace, if there is a peace agreement, we are able to sign it, and you will see that our people will rally around it. That is the best chance we have at defeating any ideology that doesn't want peace in our region. Let's convince people there is an alternative. And again, there is a lot of pain and suffering, and I understand it on the Israeli side. They should understand that there's a lot, a lot of pain and suffering over decades for the Palestinian people as well. But we, we, we shouldn't act based on what's happening now, but based on the reality we want to see tomorrow. Is it safe for a representative of the Palestinians to speak out against Hamas now? Yeah, uh, uh, why do you think it is not safe now to speak out against Hamas? We've, we've been very vocal about the actions of Hamas that we fundamentally disagree with and reject. And again, we, the Arabs are the ones who carried this resolution, which criticized any attacks against civilians. They've carried this resolution which speaks of IHL chill and protection of civilians. So we, we are very clear on the rules and, and the Arab group is proud that it has been able to say these things. And that's why some of the Europeans also had to acknowledge that they cannot continue avoiding saying the same things. And we hope that the ones who did not till now have that moral clarity will join us in rejecting anybody. It's not about who, what is the identity, the religion, the faith, the origin of the perpetrators and of the victims? It is about the principle that we need to apply as one standard against, we are, against which we are all measured. Hamas has been telling people to stay, telling civilians to stay in northern Gaza. We also understand they use civilians as human shields. Do you condemn the use of civilians as a means of war? Uh, we, we're spending a lot of time on Hamas and not enough on Israel. I'll, I'll note that once again. But I'll tell you, they're not stopping anyone from moving anywhere. There's one million and a half who have been displaced. Many have gone to the house. This is not true. People are going. We have family and friends there. We know exactly that people are going where they can, but there is nowhere safe. Again, 40% of the people killed were in the south because Israel was saying the south is going to be safer. It is not. There's no infrastructure in the south to welcome these people. And there has been a suggestion mooted of uh, building a refugee camp in the south near Khan Yunus, would that make it acceptable for Palestinian civilians yeah. to move from the north? That's not how the international law works, that you're saying you have to forcibly displace people. And I'll note that the Israeli foreign minister said that Gaza would shrink at the end of this war. So are we supposed to also help them uh, take that territory in addition? We want our people to be safe, we want, and they have a right to be safe wherever they are. Uh, Gaza is extremely dense. And again, once you've bombed 50% of the homes, one third of the hospitals, the schools, the shelters, there is no way you can get 2 million people safely into the south and with the infrastructure required. 
on hospitals, what do you and your colleagues say to the Hamas leadership, if it's correct, about them using hospitals uh, to hide military so what, infrastructure? What, what, what would you say if I told you in the last five wars, because we have experience, including UNRWA schools were targeted by Israel, UN experts went there and demonstrated that Israel targeted the schools even though there was no infrastructure and no presence for Hamas there. Mm -hmm. Us and the, and the UN have been very clear that these civilian infrastructure should be civilian and should not be used for any other purpose. But again, Israel cannot say, I'm sorry, I have to bomb churches, mosques, hospitals, schools, almost every square kilometer in Gaza, because you know Hamas is everywhere. So I, 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 I'm, I'm obliged to kill 10,000 Palestinians. Uh, I, we we have an obligation to find ways to solve these issues. And if you're talking about the people held captive, mediation can be a way to solve that issue as well. Was it tried? Was it enough tried before making choices like this one? We have seen that some of the people held captive were killed by Israeli bombs during these bombardments, or, or so it is said or, or reported. So I'm not sure what concern is the one that is there. Is it really the lives of the 200 hostages, of the 2 million Palestinian hostages in Gaza who are besieged and bombed, or is there political uh, objectives out of this, uh, out of these uh, massacres? And I, I, I tend to believe, out of 75 years of experience, that there are political objectives, that none of them is legal, none of them is moral, and this should be stopped. Ambassador Bamia, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much.